Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, find the safest path in a grid. And before we start, I just want to say we all know that leak code difficulties are pretty nonsensical and this is the perfect example of that. So I don't know who like the Luddu is at leak code that is making these difficulties, assigning them, but they literally don't make sense. And in this video, I am going to literally mathematically prove to you that this is a leak code hard. But let's just first read all this mumbo jumbo, which as usual is overcomplicated. So first of all, we're given a two dimensional grid. It looks like this. Zeros are empty. Ones are thieves. And as usual, we're going to mainly ignore like the context of this problem. Like who cares if they're thieves or whatever? It doesn't really matter to us. What we want to do is we start top left. We want to go to the bottom right. Explanation they give here is pretty long and complicated. You can read it and reread it if you want to, but let me kind of simplify it. We just want to make paths that are far away from ones. We want to be as far away from one as we possibly can. And it's not that simple because look down here at this third example. There's two of them. There's two thieves. So we want to stay far away from this guy and we want to stay far away from this guy. So that's the problem. Like if anything here is confusing to you, this is what we're trying to do. And I want to address a couple things here. So one thing they say here is that for any particular path, for example, let's look at this top one. It's pretty simple. This is the solution. Now, why is it the solution? Because the safeness factor of this path, which is basically the minimum distance from any thief. So like in this path, let's get the distance for every single cell from every single thief or rather the closest thief. This example is obviously pretty simple, but again, we could have multiple thieves. I'm trying to keep it simple with this one for now. But basically we're saying that for this cell, the distance between a thief is two. The distance from this thief for this cell is three. And by the way, how did I calculate that? Well, it's one, two, three. So down here, when they tell us that we're calculating the distance using Manhattan distance, that again is kind of complicated in my opinion, because we're really just looking for like the shortest path from here to there. And the length of that path is essentially the Manhattan distance, isn't it? Again, let's just pretend like this isn't even there. Here we have four, that's the distance. Here is three and the distance from here to the thief is two. So on this path, the safeness factor of this particular path is going to be the minimum among all of these values. So in this case, obviously the minimum is two. And let's alternatively consider a different path. Maybe we take this path instead. Well, I'll quickly show you that the minimum distance for that path would be zero because this is one, this is two, this is two, but obviously we land on a thief. So the distance, you know, the closest thief is zero away. Obviously we could also take a different path like this one. And then I think the minimum distance would just be one. So what we're saying is among all possible paths, every single path, which one has the maximum safeness factor. I think these types of problems are confusing when you have minimum and maximum in the same problem description. It can get confusing. So I want to really clarify what they're asking for. Basically, like I said earlier, we want to just stay as far away from thieves as possible. And we want to find the path that allows us to do that and then return the safeness factor of that path. In this case, it happens to be two. Okay, now we finally know what the problem is asking of us. So now it comes to actually solving this problem. I want to mention a couple things. Like first, I want to say that, of course, there is the brute force. Like at this point, we kind of know this is a graph problem. And if you're not like familiar with the graphs, I would say that don't even bother with this problem. It's probably too difficult for you. But if you know about graphs, you know that there's two common algorithms with graphs, DFS, BFS. Okay, so with DFS, obviously the brute force approach would be just go through every single path like I showed right now. And among all of them get the safeness factor and then try to maximize the safeness factor. That's an approach and kind of similar to yesterday's problem. It's going to be exponential. It's not going to be very efficient. Maybe this is the best that we can do, but if there is a better approach, 
almost certainly it's going to have some greedy element to it. So let's try to see, can we take some kind of a shortcut? Do we really have to go through every path? Let's try to explore this and I'll just kind of spoil it for you. There is a greedy approach. The funny thing about this problem is it's literally two leak code problems. I'll show those problems to you because actually those problems make this problem trivial, but one of those leak code problems is a medium and one of them is a hard. If you take two leak code problems, combine them together, one's a medium and one's a hard, the result is not a medium, right? That doesn't really make sense. Mathematically, it does not make sense. Why is this a medium problem? Either this is not a medium problem or this one is not a hard problem. And I would argue that this is definitely a hard problem. So please don't feel bad if you're not able to solve it. So the first thing I want to do is talk about the medium problem and how it is going to apply to this problem, because look at what we did a second ago. Wouldn't it be nice for every single cell if we knew the minimum distance between a thief? Kind of like what I showed here. We don't, we're not given this information. It would be nice if we were, but we're not given that information. So we have to kind of get it ourselves. How can we do that? Well, this itself, like I said, is a leak code problem. Like computing this grid here, like I've kind of done, I guess I'll fill in the other values this is a one. I think this is a two and this is a one. Filling in this grid is not trivial because the brute force for filling in this grid would not be very efficient. It would be a breadth first search because breadth first search is pretty good at computing distances. So I prefer to use that. And it would basically be for every single cell like here, do a breadth first search until you reach a one. And we'd go layer by layer. Like these are the nodes we can reach in a distance of one. These are the nodes we can reach in a distance of two from this node. And we landed on a thief. Therefore, the minimum distance from this guy to the nearest thief is going to be two. Okay, so we do that for one cell and doing it for one cell is going to be the size of the grid. Like that's the time complexity of doing that. It's going to be n squared. If we do it for every single cell, it's going to be n to the power of four. That's not very efficient. And I don't think you'll pass this problem if you try to implement it like that. Let me tell you, there is a better way. I'll show it to you right now. The idea is that we don't start at every cell. We only start at the thieves and from the thieves we run a breadth first search so from this guy i say okay there, this is one distance away this is one distance away okay this is two distance away this is two this is two okay this is three this is three next step this is four now we're done but this was pretty trivial. There's only a single thief. What if there's more thieves? Well, let's look at the bottom problem. This problem, by the way, like what I'm showing you right now, the algorithm I'm showing you right now is a leak code medium. It's called walls and gates. And the solution for it is called a multi-source breadth first search. And the idea is this, instead of just running breadth first search from this, because if we were to run breadth first search from this thief, we'd have to go over the entire grid. We might have to do that for a second thief or a third thief or a fourth thief. And at that point, again, we're at n to the power of four time complexity. The better approach is to run breadth first search from all thieves at the exact same time. So this would look something like this. So the minimum distance, obviously, for these guys is zero. The neighbors is going to be one, one here as well. Next, we do two here, two here, two here to here, here, and here. Next, we do three here, three here, three here, and three here. So this is for every single cell. Now we have the minimum distance from the nearest thief, and we did it in n squared time. And I really just want to drive home that this is another leak code problem. Like this problem, which is a leak code premium problem, unfortunately, you won't be able to solve it, I think, on leak code. But don't worry, I got you. If you click this little link here, you can still solve the same problem. And you will realize it is literally what I just showed you right now. So sorry if I spoiled it for you. I mentioned that this problem that we're solving right now is two different leak code problems. This is the first one. This is the medium one. And the other one is this, swim in rising water. If I literally open up this problem to you right now, you'll see it's literally the same problem we're about to solve right now. And the funny thing is both of those problems that I just talked about are in the neat code 150 list. So if you're wondering, how was I able to know all of this that I'm talking about right now? Did it just magically come to me? No, it's literally because I solved these two problems. This one over here, walls and gates, and this one down here, swim in rising water. Back to this problem. Now that we have this grid, remember what we're trying to do. And let me kind of clean this up because we're going to specifically focus on this example. 
So now that we have this grid, we've transformed this problem. We are now solving a different problem. Nobody cares about Manhattan distance anymore. This is a different problem. This problem is now asking us, start here, end over here, and whatever path you end up taking, try to avoid small values and try to only take big values. Whatever path you take, try to maximize the minimum value in that path. In other words, that kind of sounds greedy to me. Basically, the answer to this problem is a BFS. It's a modified BFS that takes a lot of inspiration from Dijkstra's algorithm to the point that I would just say that this is actually not a BFS. This is a modified Dijkstra's algorithm, which is going to solve this problem for us. And let me explain that algorithm to you. But like I said, it's literally the same as the other leak code problem that I talked about, except I think in that problem, instead of trying to maximize it, we're trying to minimize the distance. The idea at this point is we're starting here. We have two choices. We can either go down or we can go to the right. It doesn't really matter which one we take. We want to pick the maximum, but they're both the same in this case. So we'll go here. Now we have three choices. We can look down, we can go here, or we can go here. Remember, we're trying to always maximize the value that we take. So which one do you think we're going to take? Probably this one. Now we have a few more choices. We can go down here and we can go to the right over here. And again, at this point, it doesn't really matter whether we pick this one or this one. For the fun of it, let's pick this one at the top. We pick it and now we're probably not going to choose this one. So this is kind of a dead end for us. Now we're going to pick this one. Now we have a few more choices down here and to the right. Which one do you think we're going to take? Probably uh, this one. But at this point, you kind of realize, right? It's not that we just have one choice or two choices. We literally have one, two, three, three, four, five choices, and it's going to keep growing potentially. So why not put all of these choices into a better data structure so that we don't have to literally iterate over all of them? Like if it's stored in a list, for example, isn't there a better data structure, perhaps called a heap or priority queue? And in our case, we're going to use a max heap because obviously we are trying to maximize the values that we pick from. So just imagine all of these are in a max heap. And then from that heap, we're going to pop the maximum in this case, it happens to be three. And now we're here. And now I'll just kind of continue with it. You probably get the idea. We'll go down here and then we're going to go to the right here. So we found a path. Now, this is different than the solution path that they showed. Like the solution path they showed is, I think, this. Ours is slightly different. Ours is going like this, I think. But this is still a valid path because if you look at the path, the minimum among all values on this path is going to be a two. So that is the result. So we found the result, but there's just one thing I didn't explain as we were doing this. You tell me how are we keeping track of the minimum distance that we have seen so far? And it's kind of confusing because when you look at what I've done here, this is not just one path. This is the path, like for example, this is the solution path, but there was also a cell visited over here. So what do we do about that? That one did not lead us to the path. Well, this is why it's a modified Dijkstra's approach. We know that Dijkstra's is a shortest path algorithm. In a sense, Dijkstra's accumulates values, like it accumulates distances. In this problem, we are not accumulating anything. We're not adding up the total of this path. At that point, it would literally be the same as Dijkstra's algorithm, but this is modified. This is different. We're actually paying attention to what was the minimum value that we saw. So what we're actually going to do when we solve this problem with our modified Dijkstra's and with our priority queue, our max heap, this is what we're actually going to do. Let me rewind this. This is our max heap. We start at the top left. We have a guy with distance three and its coordinates are zero, zero. And then we pop this from the heap and then we look at its neighbors and add the neighbors to the heap. Both of them have a distance of two. Simple so far. I think the coordinates are zero, one and one, zero. So now these guys are also in the heap. Now, this is the part where it gets interesting. This three over here, when we add it to the heap, we're not going to add three, one, one to the heap. This is not what we're going to do because when we have a path, for example, like this one, and then we arrive at this cell, what we want to know is, okay, we took this path to get here. What is the minimum distance 
for this path itself. We don't care about the value at this cell. I mean, we kind of do, it is relevant, but what's more relevant is the minimum of the entire path itself. So what we would say is take the minimum of three and two. And so what we would actually add to the heap here is two. 1, 1. And we wouldn't just do that for this. In the other case, for example, if the value here was not a 3 and it was actually a 1, what we would do is take the minimum of 1 and 2, and then here we would add 1 for the distance, the minimum distance to reach this cell. Think of it as that. This value is the minimum distance to reach this cell. And so now you can probably see why we're doing it this way, because by the time we reach the result, we will have the minimum distance it took to reach this cell, it'll be two. We'll have the minimum distance it took to reach this guy, it'll be two. Same for all of these pretty much. I think the only one that wouldn't be two is the original starting point, three, because both of its neighbors are two, so it's never going to get higher than that. So that's the main idea. Let me just spend like 30 seconds to quickly just dry run through this, knowing everything that we talked about. So we start here, three, zero, zero. I'm not even going to add the coordinates just to kind of save time. We started with the three. Okay, then we went to the two neighbors and we add the two neighbors. To add this neighbor, since we just popped this, we're going to take the minimum of three and two, which is the neighbor itself. Obviously, that's going to be two. So we add two here, and then we would do the same thing for this guy. We'll add two here. It's the minimum. And now suppose we go down here, like we popped this guy, it came from down here. We're gonna look at the two neighbors, one here and then three over there. So for the one, obviously we're gonna take the minimum of one and two, which was one. And then for this guy, three, minimum of two and three, which is two, we add that. And now just to kind of save time, let's say uh, we pop this, we popped the three, even though the distance it took to reach that three is a two. And then we, let's say, go down here, push the two on here. Uh, I think you probably get the idea, so I'll just skip the rest of it. Let's quickly talk about the time complexity before we code this up. So in the worst case, we're never going to visit the same cell multiple times. So in the worst case, we'll visit each cell a single time. So we'll add each coordinate to the heap and pop it from the heap a single time. So for every coordinate, that's going to be big O of N squared. That's every coordinate. How much does it take to push and pop from the heap? Well, that's going to be log N. You might think, well, isn't it log N squared? Because we're going to potentially add every single cell. Technically, yes, but if you're familiar with logarithms, you know that the two becomes a constant here, and then we don't really care about constants. So that's how I'm getting this time complexity. Space complexity, I think, is going to be n squared because we're going to have this grid that we're going to be computing. So now let's code it up. Um, if you're curious how I was able to solve this problem, I think these comments that I left are pretty much my thought process and how I was able to like narrow it down. I don't know if this is going to be helpful for you or not, but let's get into it. I think the first thing we want to do is just get the dimension of this and it's a square grid, so it's just going to be this. So the first thing I want to do is basically solve that leak code medium I was talking about, basically the pre-computing that we're going to be doing. For every single cell in the grid, we want to compute the distance from the nearest thief. So we'll do that just like I talked about earlier, basically a multi-source breadth first search. So I'm going to declare a variable that I'm going to call the queue. What we're trying to do here is just get all of the thieves so that we can put them in this queue and then we'll run the breadth first search. I'm going to say for r in range n for c in range n. If this is a one, that's how we know it's a thief. And in that case, we're going to say q dot append the row, the column. And I'm actually going to do a third thing. I'm going to also put the distance for this thief, because obviously we know for this cell, it is literally a thief. So the distance from it and the nearest thief is literally zero. That's going to be helpful for us in the breadth first search. While I'm doing that, I might as well just store the minimum distance for this cell. And so the way I'm going to do that, we could obviously use a grid. So for every cell, we could put the minimum distance for every like position, but I'm going to just prefer to use a hash map just because that's my thing. That's what I do. It's usually easier to declare it at least. And so here I'm going to say that the minimum distance for this coordinate is going to be zero. Great. Now we run the breadth first search. Now we say while the queue is not empty, let's 
pop from the queue, pop left. And when we pop, we'll get the row, the column, and the distance. Now we want to go through the neighbors of this position. Because assuming that these are thieves, we don't need to store the distance for them. They've already been added to the queue, therefore they, we've already stored the minimum distance for them. Now let's go through the neighbors. To do that, let's actually declare the neighbors, like the four adjacent neighbors. It's gonna be r plus one column, r minus one, same column, same row, but column plus one, same row, but column minus one. Those are the four adjacent directions. Now we're gonna do for r2, c2, these are the neighbors. I know it's not like the best name, but you can probably do better than me, but this is the neighbor. And for this neighbor, we want to know if this has not already been computed, if this pair is not already in min distance. It's basically like we're using this to track visited positions so that we don't like end up doing extra work. So if this has not already been computed, let's go ahead and compute it. Let's say minimum distance for this guy is gonna be, and how do we do this, this part? Well, that's exactly why I stored the distance in the queue because we know it took this much distance to reach this cell. So to take one extra step, which is all we did, we only took one extra step in four different directions. So the distance here is just gonna be distance plus one. And of course we want to append this to the queue. So uh, just like this, R2, C2, and the distance, which is just distance plus one. So it's definitely important here that you also put distance plus one because we are using that. Like that is what's gonna be popped in the next iteration of the breadth for search. From this entire function, all we wanna do now is just return what we computed. We want to return that minimum distance hash map. So now down here, we can just say minimum distance is just going to be pre-computing. Great. I think there's one thing I didn't check, which is we are dealing with a grid. So it's technically possible that this coordinate could be out of bounds. We're not going to get like an out of bounds index error since we are using a hash map, but we don't want to go out of bounds either way. I'm going to write a helper function for this because we actually are going to need it again when we implement uh, the modified dixtras. So I'm going to declare this function in bounds given a row and a column, determine if it's in bounds. Basically, we just want to make sure that the row and column are greater than or equal to zero. So I'm going to say, let's just get the minimum of row and column, make sure it's greater than or equal to zero. And we want to make sure that neither of them are greater than or equal to N. So let's just say that the max of both of them is going to be less than N. So this is the helper function. And now we're just going to use it down here, um, here. So in bounds for row two, column two, and we want this to also be true before we visit that neighbor. Okay, so now we solved the first leak code problem. Now let's solve the second one. It's not gonna be too much more code, believe it or not. There's a couple things we wanna do to set up this modified Dijkstra's approach. First, of course, the max heap. Problem with Python is there's no minimum heap, so we're gonna need a small workaround. So first of all, what I'm gonna add to this heap is gonna be three values. Um, I'll leave a little comment here to indicate that. It's gonna be the distance, the row, and the column. Starting with the row and column, the starting position, it's pretty simple. It's just gonna be zero, zero. The distance itself, the minimum distance for that position is obviously just gonna be this, but the problem with Python is there's no max heap. This is gonna be a min heap by default. So to get around that, we put a negative sign over here. And that's gonna be kind of confusing for the rest of this, but that's just what we have to do in Python. The last thing is we don't wanna to have to visit the same cell multiple times. So of course we're gonna have a hash set. We didn't really need that up above because we kind of just reused this for it, but now we definitely are gonna need it. And since we started with this position, we might as well add that to the visit hash set just like this. Now is when we start the actual uh, Dijkstra's. So while the max heap is not empty, we're going to pop from that max heap. So heap q dot heap pop max heap. And we're gonna get those three values I mentioned up above, the distance, the row, and the column. We know that the distance though was negative, so we wanna make it normal again. We wanna turn it back into positive, so let's do this. First things first, as soon as we land on the destination, we are done. Like that's the point of Dijkstra's algorithm. It's a greedy algorithm. So if this row, column, pair is equal to the destination n minus one, uh, n minus one, then we can return. What are we gonna return? The distance, of course, the minimum distance. So that's what we return here. 
And if we don't return, we are going to continue with the breadth first search. So we're going to need the neighbors of this current position. I'm just going to copy and paste it. There's probably a way to reuse this, but I personally don't care. So I'm just going to copy and paste it. And I'm also going to copy and paste the next line over here because that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go through the neighbors of the current position for the neighbors. Of course, we want to make sure it's inbound. So I guess I'll copy and paste this part too. And not only that, we want to again, make sure it hasn't been visited just like before, but this time we're going to use a different data structure. We're going to say row two, column two is not in visit. So if this is the case, then we're going to add this coordinate now to the max heap. And we're also going to mark it visited at the same time, kind of like what we did up above. So we'll say mark this as visited, visit.add, row two, column two, and push to the heap, heap Q dot heap push to the max heap, a new pair. Of course, it's going to include row two, column two. And this is probably the tricky part. This is probably the part that's going to confuse you, even though I think I did explain it in the drawing explanation. It's not simple to understand. So I don't blame you if you have to go back and rewind it. But remember what we're trying to do along the path. We want to know what was the minimum distance it took to reach this cell. What was the minimum distance that can include the previous cell row column, or it could include the current cell. Because the previous distance, this is the distance it took to reach this. So either this is smaller or the current one that we're at is smaller. Min distance of row two, column two. Again, I know this part is kind of confusing. That's why I'm putting it into a separate line. So I'm putting uh, this here. I guess I'll call this distance two. And distance two is what we're going to push to the heap. Actually, I guess uh, we should probably make it a negative as if there weren't enough things to worry about in this problem. I guess it's only 40 lines of code, but that's definitely misleading. Like there's a lot of thought that goes into solving this problem. So yeah, I'd say it qualifies as a leak code hard, but I just ran it. And as you can see, it does work. I think it is relatively efficient, but you know, I don't really care about the leak code run times in terms of big O time complexity. I think it is optimal. If you're preparing for coding interviews, definitely check out neatcode.io, the Neatcode 150 list. I'm telling you, it helps a lot. There's a reason I made it because I found these problems to be exceptional. And I think the problem we solved today kind of proved that. But thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.